Hello, I'm uh, Stephen Robinson, or the Play Typer Guy, as my son calls me. And uh, my guest today is Lisa Timmons, who is a writer, performer, actor, so many multi hyphenates. It's just so impressive. Um, and uh, you've worked for, uh, you've written for the Uptight Citizens Brigade, where you've um, directed and produced their live and some of their lives and film shows. You've worked with the Groundlings. You've appeared in um, a very funny Stranger Things promo uh, for, on, for Netflix. <laughs> I uh, love that you found that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, so thank you so much for for joining us. Um, however, what I am a tremendous <laughs> fan of the sort of social political commentary you've been doing on uh, your social media, specifically Instagram, uh, where you, I would say, uh, satirize some of the more entitled and ridiculous people on the planet, ranging from <laughs> the current and far less interesting Princess of Wales, uh, Kate Middleton, and I her agree. <laughs> and her <laughs> her goopiness herself, Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, I'm going to play one of the Paltrow videos. Obviously, if you are listening to the podcast version of this, you won't be able to see it. Um, I'm going to include all relevant um, links in the description. But um, we're going to show this. If you are watching, you can see it. And then we can talk about we it. We all after. struggle to connect with other people because we are all incredibly rich and have no concept of how most people on this planet actually live. So to combat the feeling of isolation that you get from having alienated all of humanity, I created this product where you just take this thing and you microwave it so that you get it hot and it will simulate the feeling of a friend coming up behind you, giving you a hug and saying, hey, great job. Um, the way you're living your life is totally ethical and makes sense and it's not hurting anybody. And, you know, at the end of the day, what's better than a hug? A hug you can buy. <laughs> a hug you can buy. Uh <laughs> I, I'm laughing because I am so smug when I do her. It's, yeah, I wanted like, to I know. I don't even like, like myself. <laughs> so if you can tell us what inspired both the Gwyneth persona and the videos, but th those videos in general, like... Because you're, you know, I, I was while watching them. It seemed your Instagram was a kind of normal Instagram, you know, and then suddenly, sort of, you started to segue into this. So, you, you tell us a bit about that. I'm really curious. By the way, segue is a really kind way to say I snapped, friend. <laughs> 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 you know, the very, very specific genesis of this whole sort of genre that I've fallen into, this lip dub thing. Uh, I, if you are listening and not just watching, I have a bandage on my right arm. Uh, that is because I'm recovering from having broken my arm in a stupid, silly little accident that has cost me so much money. And I, you know, that was in October. And at the time I couldn't, you know, I'm aspiring TV writer and I was hard at work developing a TV show with, with uh, a colleague, a, a, a contact and, you know, things felt promising. And I, you know, this accident happened and specifically my right hand, my, I can't, it hurts to type. Like the very specific motion of typing hurts the most, more than lifting or any. And I was just like, you know, this is, this is so poetic. And then, so the only thing I could really do was use my phone. And I've always, uh, since I moved to Los Angeles in 2002, I've been really uh, fascinated. I mean, it's pretty much my entire experience of uh, politics and local politics uh, as a, a young voter. And in California, we vote on so many things. Like we, there's so many propositions and, um, you know, we, we end up with so many runoffs, you know, even if people are in the same party. So it's a lot of, uh, you have to be, it's a kind of a, it's a context for it. I feel like voting in California takes a lot of effort. And, um, so I would, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just somebody who I have this, 
I have this obsession with justice <laughs> and it sounds, it sounds hyperbolic to say it, but I think if you watch my videos and you see that I do one a day, like I'm, a lot of these are first takes because it's just literally how I feel. It's literally the <laughs> monologue going on in my head the, at all times. I'm just like, I, I often say to people, I can't unknow something and it's a problem because like, if I understand the origin of something problematic and then like logically I can apply it to daily life, then I, f I go, wait, why isn't everybody getting this? Like, this is weird. This is crazy. <laughs> so, I mean, I just was, uh, oh, very specifically Gwyneth Paltrow. The first video that exploded was, um, called Gwyneth Paltrow's eating poor people and <laughs> cooking up poor people bacon. And it was, I, think I had just doom scrolled with my broken arm through all of these images of the revolution in Iran and little girls and just like these images of like all this suffering from climate change, like, like Pakistan, underwater and you know all these things uh puerto rico not having power for as long as it did and i i was just like i felt so overwhelmed i mean like even talking about it i'm like i'm like getting there and this thin blonde blue-eyed woman in a pale pink gucci ensemble was casually demonstrating in order to sell, I don't even know what she was selling. Maybe it was the pan, I can't remember. But I was like, you know what? They, they're gonna eat us. That's what they're gonna do. They're gonna eat, eat us. And you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna look real cute while doing it because we keep giving them our money. And I was so angry. And also, I had also seen before that she was supporting Rick Caruso and, I, I, you know, George Santos, Kristen Cinema, like, these these people who are using the like just vote all blue all democrats are the same guys we're all in this together and you're like oh, oh my gosh guys why do you act like we are in the same club we're not and so i just i think i just yeah i was just snapped and i was just i i think that was that was definitely a first take because i was just like so sarcastic and i just felt like i was like literally the vibe is look at this asshole <laughs> and I think, and then people just connected with it. And, you know, I've been trying to break into entertainment, like uh, TV and, and, and movies for the past 20 years. And, you know, I, it really was only recently that I was like, what is the factor here? I can't figure it out because, um, you know, not to brag, but if you look at my account, like I can produce, I'm quite funny, you know, I'm very I, I know how to write jokes, you know, I've been doing this for a very long time, but nobody has ever, 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 ever hired me to do it. And I've been in writer's rooms, you know, I've been in contact with people who could have put me in places and they did not. And I thought, to, and the thing, and you do have to wait for permission in, in the industry, you know what I mean? Like, if you're going outside of it, that's different. But if you have agreed to try to participate, you know, in, in this exchange, then you kind of know that you're like, you might put in a lot of years, but hey, there's that reward once your number gets pulled, once you, you know, the squid game of it all. And I just reached a point where I started to realize that class was the one factor I was not taking into account because I was like, I don't, I literally was like, I'm, a, you know, I went to college, I'm white. I do not have any discernible accent. I mean, look at my name. I was like, you know, I, I know for a fact that that's not the reason. I was like, that's not the mm. reason because those have never been obstacles for me. Like everyone, that's not a problem. But I was like, the minute I opened my damn mouth, these people realize we have nothing in common. <laughs> and then I'm like, ah, and I didn't know that either. And so there would just be my... I think a lot of people made a lot of assumptions based on that. And then I'm, I'm, I, I wasn't what was expected. Like, I mean, I've been saying and thinking these things my entire life, but people mm -hmm. have not been receptive to them up until very recently when I think a oh, lot yeah. of people snapped. Well, I think on a lot Sorry, of- Sorry, I went on for a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you. And I, you know, to your point, I think I would often be that way of just, assuming perhaps of my naivete that 
people who made it. It was like the same sort of blood, sweat and tears or whatever. And even people I admire, like I remember uh, Anthony Bourdain, it's like uh, his uh, mother worked for the New Yorker. And that's how one of his first articles that later became um, No Reservations got started. Not to say that he's not brilliant. He was not brilliant and charming. No, but it helps us guy. to understand. And uh, Josh Whedon, who is not particularly a uh, sort of persona non grata now, but you know, I was a big fan of his uh, in my youth, of his work. And again, he had family in the business. Because at the time I was like, oh, I must be an, you know, I'm an idiot. I'm not a 27 year old doing Buffy, right? I don't, I'm not doing my own TV show in my, you know, late twenties or thirties. Like, oh, well, my dad didn't do it. And my don't, I don't have a name to get you in there. So that definitely speaks to that. I think to go back to what you're doing, I feel like one benefit of social media has been a sort of democratization of being able, because, you know, just, you know, when just 20 or so years ago, how would you get your work out there? You know, you're, I remember being in school and the kids, at literal with super eights and filming that stuff, or oh even the writing, if you, you know, I, no one could see my stuff if, but now you can really put up a blog or put up a, you, your work can really get out there in ways that you sort of, um, can't other uh, otherwise i do want to also play the kate middleton one because that was one family of is different um and you know the pressures we all face are different uh and yet i think it's a wonderful idea to sit here and pretend as if i have any clue as to what it is like to raise a child who is not um uh, thought to be chosen by god to um run a country like i uh, honestly i don't know how how do you guys do it like do um do you just say, hey, uh, one day you will just be granted this magical power that will make everyone want to pay for your um, existence? It's uh, what do you guys call that in the lower class? <laughs> that is your voice doing uh, a very good Kate Middleton. Um, and uh, it, it this will seem a strange, uh, perhaps not a compliment. I do mean it as a compliment, but it sort of reminds me of um, Chevy Chase doing Gerald Ford. So the idea <laughs> is that yes. there was a liberate sense of, you know, we're not, and I and I feel like this is something um, with all respect to some of later uh, Saturday Night Live actors. They at the beginning it was like we're not going to do Rich Little. The, the point is not to try to literally do this person's voice as if we're De Niro or something and get inside the character. We're trying to find what's sort of the absurdity of this person. What can we sort of send up? We're going to play that. And that's what sort of reminds me of that. Because now when I sometimes I will watch Saturday Night Live and I, I, I think Chloe Feynman, for example, someone who's tremendously talented and wonderful, but I think lately they've gotten, Saturday Night Live sometimes I believe has not used her very well in a sense of it's been oh, right, you can really do this. Per Literally, you can sound like Kate Middleton. And so we're not going to actually write any jokes. We're just going to have you sort of sound like this person or someone come in and sort of sound like Gwyneth Paltrow. Whereas you're sort of like, I'm going to, to me, it's like I'm trying to find, as you said, the smugness or that sort of <laughs> disconnect from the world. Because her whole goop thing, that just felt, I was sort of my Andy Kaufman moment. It's like, okay, you're joking, right? Like you were literally sending this up as a, a, you know the irony of the fact of how out of touch you are, but it's it's not. Um, if I could go back to the, asking you about the Rick Caruso thing, because that was very revealing. Um, Paltrow, I think Katy Perry. There was a lot of celebrities, um, often let's say overtly white women, well well off white women, who are sort of anti-Trump had been, you know, I used to joke, like folks with resistance and fight fascism and so forth in their online profiles. And suddenly it's like, oh, oops, I saw I, my stiletto almost broke on a homeless person when I was walking home. And now I, I, I want to vote for a Republican. 
posing as a Democrat. Like that was not, there was no chance of like, you've been fooled. It was just sort of, no, 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 I, I'm, I am literally a Trump clone and I'm going to make the homeless people go away because it's not like K Karen Bass was running on an all homeless all the time pol platform. Like she was going to try to address the issue, right? Like, and you've lived there. Like, so what, what was the reasoning for these people to not support, you know, Karen Bass as opposed to uh, this guy? So, Simil so we, California is very interesting because if you, uh, the California Democrat is a very uh, interesting creature. I, I learned very much during the 2016 and beyond, you know, I, I did know before because I was, you know, in, interested in local politics, but I really did not know the full extent of how um, we appeared to be this bastion of hope on the left coast the you know the blue sanctuary you know gavin newsom talking you know very charismatic and coming out strong from san francisco and then the thing is it's it's such a it's so hollywood it's so very revealing because hollywood Holly, it's the smoke and mirrors of you know being a place that creates dreams and monetizes them <laughs> and like you know this and and it's and it, you know speaking very specifically about you know the unhoused population and it continues to grow and more and more people are falling off that i then i think people it can understand in terms of like where like there's this idea that it is such an impossibility for so many people and really a couple bad moves a lot of people are a couple bad moves away from their life drastically changing and then you know you're never able to get back up it's really hard mm. once it happens and so because of our weather you know and because of the entertainment industry historically a lot of people just come here with it. i remember i don't know if you ever saw that movie burlesque with Cher and christina aguilera but at the beginning oh, yeah. the, i remember the trailer i was like oh man i really wish they wouldn't show this this is a terrible propaganda it was christina aguilera going i'll have a one-way ticket to hollywood please and it's like <laughs> oh my gosh no girl no that's how, oh, that's how it ends and so i i specifically have come to learn that the California Democrat often only is as progressive as they can be until you ask them very please to redistribute their wealth. Like they cannot give up anything, anything. Like it is, it is such a wonderful charade that a lot of people have bought into this idea of, I mean, I always thought it was funny to hear them people talking about the Hollywood elite because so many times like these conspiracy theorists are so close because yes they are the Hollywood elite but it's the one like but I don't think you understand like do you notice they're all in the same room giving each other awards and going oh my gosh great job girl yeah me too I voted for you I know I told you to it's like <laughs> yeah you know and so the the idea that there's a secret group of people behind these group of people who are overtly doing this like it was just so crazy. And then you're absolutely right. Gwyneth Paltrow, I, I, what on earth, other than being thin, makes you think that suddenly you are a bastion of wellness? That is absolutely insane. And so for, I think for a long time, I just kind of ignored people like that. And it's dangerous. Uh, Katy Perry is another one. And I, because I didn't realize these people were slowly taking over everything. Mm -hmm. Like Katy Perry owns what's the Bragg's apple cider vinegar, which started off as a family business. And it's just it's like, you're taking over, you're, you're taking over family businesses. What you're a pop star. Who's now a reality star. Cause you, like, how much do you need that? I think that's the real thing is I, I put a Taylor Swift post up and on it, like, I have to tell you, people do not attack me. It is wild. Like I, <laughs> I should have way more <laughs> angry people, but I really, truly, truly, truly believe that people can follow their dreams of, you know, creating their art and doing whatever, 
without destroying the planet in the process, without saying, I have to always be prom king. Like, it's okay to let other people shine. And that's, I think that's, that's my frustration. Is I'm like, you guys just take everything. Like, you take everything. Can't you just share? Like, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and Paltrow was sort of a very extreme wealthy version of this because she already has tons of money. But there is sort of that phenomenon of influencers where it is um, upper class people sort of sharing. Here's my very, here's the apartment in New York that my parents paid for. And um, you, a poor person, is watching this and now I'm going to get money as a business by showing you my fabulous life. It's just weird. It's like a reverse GoFundMe as opposed to sort of like, well, why don't we actually oh see gosh. the person yes. living, the, the single mom living in one apartment with two kids sleeping in the Willy Wonka bed, like that, and then we should give them money, but it's the reverse. It's sort of, it's, it is very, it is very strange. And what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, the California Democrat. I mean, we see this in New York. I lived in New York for 15 years. And there was an article in The Cut recently about this one woman sort of, because there's always someone wealthier. So she's a very well-off lady in Brooklyn Heights who's envying some other, like looking at some <laughs> apartment she they can't get into. Are. And, and, but from her standpoint, she's struggling. You cannot find a rich person in New York. Like even if they are making 800 to a million a year, they'll explain, well, I'm not really rich because I have to send my kids to no black people uh, private school. And then I have to have nannies and I have to have, you know, my all, all these, then they list all these luxuries. Um, and I think, you know, it it is something where you read that and I, in my own way, will write things sort of making fun of it. But this, what you do is even you know, obviously funnier in a sense of you go to just sort of sending up that absurdity of someone being like, oh, my life is, well, without realizing, well, people are in a tremendously worse state. Um, you know, I had um, spoken with uh, Caitlin um, Bird at uh, Day Magazine about someone was talking about, you know, Floridians deserve what's happening over there. Um, even though it's really just basically a white majority voting to oppress a minority of the population. It is not like, so these are literally people suffering. And when you point that out, like, okay, well, you shouldn't actually do the Bugs Bunny meme about cutting Florida off because you're just leaving lots of marginalized people and all across the South in all of these so-called red states to their fate, you know, the queer people, you know, not all queer people, despite what you see on, you know, television and uh, uh, HGTV shows, they're not all wealthy. It's not all will and grace. It's not all, there are a lot of, <laughs> they're often the most uh, in the margins. And um, this idea then it's like, oh, well, they should move, you know, they should move, which is very, let them eat cakes. Like, well, to where, do you know how expensive it, it, if you're poor, uh, it is hard to move within your own state, let alone to uh, these supposedly blue state utopias where you're talking about rent that's like $3,000 for one room. So if you're a single mom with two kids, how are you going to actually live there? No one, no one's going to pay you a living wage. Um, and you would most likely wind up essentially the problem that Gwyneth Paltrow and Katy Perry want to have someone like Rick Caruso, Caruso solve for them. Um, and uh, that is, you know, I think you, you've you been really speaking to that, of the idea of uh, just the, the wealthy is a sort of kind of not willing to give up even a fraction of their, um, of their wealth and of their uh, privilege to resolve the issue. Um, and it is, I mean, no one talks about it without connecting it to obviously income inequality. So all we heard about San Francisco was the, you know, they're too soft on crime as opposed to, well, over the past 20 years, you've like, because of Silicon Valley and the tech world, it's 
insanely expensive. Like what happened to people who, as you say, were one bad move, like someone raising their rent and like, well, where do I go? And they have nowhere to go. Um, so that was so depressing. I feel like I'm now going to play one last <laughs> one of yours to cheer everyone up. The guy coming up here says that in May, even though every day on average 500 Americans die from COVID, it will no longer be a public health safety emergency. I mean, at least the federal government's not going to pay for stuff anymore, right? Yes. Oh my gosh, Aubrey, you get it. Like, I am just tired of having to give people money for like being sick. I hate it. Okay. Uh, yo, everybody hates it. Dumb, dumb. <laughs> so uh i'm glad you so, raised our spirits with that one i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> yes uh i know uh some, i'm kidding uh, they're all dark though what am i saying <laughs> some viewers will not be pleased that you uh often make fun of the current administration um that means you want trump yeah. to come back it's very animal farm uh you know if you say anything bad you, that, but you want trump to come back you know this type of uh mentality but uh, what's your take? You've been very critical of um, Joe Biden and uh, as someone who, you know, you're not the pamper celebrity. You're a working woman trying to survive. And what what is your what is your take there? So I you made a really good point about how that person, Katie, I think I think the, the person you mentioned who was, you know, intimating that, oh, Florida should be cut off. I had experiences like that, that clued me in. So I, Katie, I'm guessing is a white lady. Um, I'm a white lady, appearance wise. My mother is from Columbia, South America. And I have a, um, I have a manner of speech that indicates that I probably went to college. Mm -hmm. I sound like, somebody from a very specific income level. I am starting to realize <laughs> that I think that my grandma Twyla sounds like that. And I think she sounded like that in order to sound fancy. And it has suited my family well. But I, I realized people like Katie who look like Katie, who but who don't have my background, don't know anybody like that. Because when I saw that, I'm like, my whole family's in Florida, dude, like Florida yeah, yeah. and South Georgia. Like I, number one, if I can't afford to be here anymore, that's where I got to go. And oh, exactly. like, I don't know where you guys get, I knew I started to slowly put peace together out here in Los Angeles when their times were tough for people and people were like, uh, I stayed out here because I uh, uh, had a, a wonderful romance this blossom. I'm now engaged. But I would have probably gone home to Georgia with my mom. And all these people from Los Angeles like me who hadn't, you know, we weren't making those, we hadn't made that bump yet, you know, to that, you know, that first writing job that, that changes your life. And so I saw where everybody was going back to. I saw, oh, oh, you're always safe. You are always oh, yeah. safe no matter where you go. That is so wonderful for you. And I realized that they, and I was angry at first. I was very angry and I was call out like, and I was like, you know, that is really how, how, what an asshole. How couldn't you have thought of that? That's so rude of you and cruel. And, you know, you just don't have any empathy. And then I, um, I think that's around the time I realized that I had a blind spot for ableism. <laughs> And I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> right. I cannot come at people with that energy because if someone had come at me with that energy, it would have been very hard for me to learn and grow from it. And oh, so yeah. I started to think to myself, well, what is the language of the white ladies around whom I have spent a great deal of time in my career? It's kind of like sarcastic, passive aggressive, mean girl talk. And mm -hmm. I started to realize that if I was going to reach these ladies who wanted to flirt with some like socialist ideas, and then I was going to have to speak their language and appeal to them and be like, hey, girls, look at this girl over here. Like, let's like not be like her, oh, yeah. right? Like, let's not 
do that. And so I'm literally like, oh my gosh, if I can make it uncool <laughs> to be an elitist, then maybe we have hope because I started to realize that white women are very angry right now. They're very, mm -hmm. very angry. And they, and it's funny because, uh, you know, I don't think it's anyone's job to talk to them who hasn't already tried really hard. <laughs> so I'm like, well, I have noticed that they're more receptive to talking to me and I'm kind of like the gateway drug into like more progressive radical ideas of realizing that like it is literally all of us versus <laughs> a tiny group of people and so I, I do I do get pushback from a lot of white ladies and I um not a lot because I have a lot of ladies who get it and who think like me, who who don't invest in the white womanhood concept, who are like actively divesting. But you see, but I get these ladies who point out to me, hey, you're being misogynist when you talk about white women. And then I very kindly, as much as I can, if I think the person's gonna hear me, I comment back and I explain that we are trying to dismantle white feminism. We do not want non-intersectionality. This is what we're doing here. You know, it, it's really, it's not a discussion. It's it's me mm -hmm. saying, no, this is what's happening. And if the person replies back and we have a dialogue and, and it can work, I keep it going. And I have commenters who keep it going. But if somebody, if somebody is not trying to hear me, I don't want fights. I have a lot of great people who follow and a lot of people who are, coming for information. I had a lady call me out. I've had a couple of ladies go, hey, you know what? I really love what you're doing. I think it's very funny. But I got to tell you, you know, it's not a good look. It's not very feminist to be having so many white ladies. And I was like, I have to tell you that I hear you and I understand where you're coming from. But what I think you think is happening is you think I'm calling them out. I am using these capitalist icons, these symbols of white womanhood, and I have noticed which ones get the most hits. And this is propaganda. And mm. I am actively targeting these women for eyeballs because this is not about cancel culture. This is not about this and that. We are actively fighting a war and people need to understand what's going on. I used a Gwyneth Paltrow po post to alert Los Angeles that the LA City Council Public Safety Committee approved funding, private funding from, you know, it's not the LAPD's taxpayer dollars. It's literally just coming from some rich people for the robot police dogs. And when they realize, when I explain to them, listen, this is, my goal is not to make fun of somebody or a laugh. I'm trying to scare you because this is happening now. These are not, and, and it's happening to us. Like we're not immune. You're not her. So by the way, you're not safe. Mm -hmm. She's not even safe. Like oh, the stuff that's happening, like it's, it's like, it's crazy. Like it's so funny. Some people, people are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you tag them. I'd be so scared. I'm like, what are they going to do? <laughs> what are they going to do um, to me? What do I have that they are going to take? Um, I, Bell Hooks <laughs> is not someone, um, I guess, who's being removed from a lot of uh, Black history courses, uh, but Bell Hooks, I think, said it best, and it's always been my own sort of mantra. Uh, feminism is not self-actualization. It is more than that. And I think when you get that pushback, what's happening is sort of the idea that Gwyneth Paltrow, her self-actualization, she's a feminist, you support her, or being very successful at what she does. Same with Katy Perry, others, you know, the girl power, like this um, CEO of a polluting company that is awful. And uh, this oil company president is a woman. Isn't that great? It's like, well, not particularly. I mean, it's it's sort of who is running the plantation. It's not necessarily um, the issue. It's sort of a superficial type of diversity or feminism. And I, you know, I, I'm glad that you are sort of calling that out, especially because what happened in California was such a perfect example of that because 
Paltrow had the ability to sort of reject what Caruso was doing. Again, Caruso was running against a Black woman who already was going to, the ability for all sort of the stealth coding of how she was going to be soft on crime, the true sort of intersexual feminism would be, I'm going to support the first uh, woman, you know, Black woman uh, mayor of this huge um, city. Instead, it was like, no, I'm going to support the white man who's going to protect not me, but every woman who sees herself in me, who feels insecure. And because my goodness, if Gwyneth Paltrow, who has personal security and probably does not live near anywhere that has so crime problems, if she feels unsafe, if she feels unsafe enough to support Crusoe, then I certainly feel justified because I saw a homeless person or there's been some petty crime in my neighborhood. Because all of those things were real things that were happening. Um, no one wants to discount that. No one wants to minimize that. It's just that Crusoe had no solutions for it. I mean, other than perhaps a final one, but that there was no um, removing all the homeless people, making that go away, essentially. Um, and that we had this in Portland and Oregon. There was a potential where it was came very close to a Republican uh, governor winning because in every... And New, the New York governor's race was very close. Thank you. One thing that popped out that was very uh, interesting about, uh, again, Katy Perry and Gwyneth Paltrow supporting just this sort of, it, it, it makes it more dangerous. And it was just a bunch of white guys attacking, it sort of neutralized Karen Bass, Bass's argument, right? Bass's argument. So it just makes it, it is something of where, it's worth targeting her for doing this. Like this was like not a cool move at all, especially post Trump. Like we would have learned like the business guy who says I'm a deal maker and I can make things work. One, he's not going to make it work and he's going to actively make things worse all along. So, um, so right now, for those who are viewing, you are wearing a t-shirt, the grit, um, a, a, no, a uh, much beloved, now no longer with us, um, restaurant in Athens, Georgia. And so this was a fun thing. You are a graduate of UGA, as am I. Um, so this was such a random connection. I was thinking of you as a very LA person, but you have a Georgia connection. So uh, that is awesome. Um, you, uh, I, of course, I attended a uh, sometime before you um with marjorie <laughs> with marjorie taylor green we are of the she and i are the same graduating class sort of a, a political a political transporter accident <laughs> but um so uh, but the other uh connection other than being bulldogs is that uh when i was at uga i um wrote about television as I do now, but I wrote about television a lot. And I had a TV column that over time essentially became a weekly distillation of what had happened on the TV show, Melrose Place. I was obsessed with this TV show. Oh, I believe friend. you are quite a fan <laughs> uh, as well. Such a fan. Such a fan. <laughs> um, and you run a, uh, your own a sort of a separate uh, Melrose Place um, Instagram it was charmed like some of my some of my favorite scenes there was kimberly in hell beckoning my it was such a in weird show oh, it was yes. such a weird time for um editing <laughs> oh my god uh that it was just such a you know for anyone it's been sad to say 30 years uh since the show debuted originally as sort of a beverly hills 90210 type you know obviously it's a sequel but kind of and a, you know, this is like the real world. Uh, the character of Michael Mancini was sort of like um, running the the older guy um, running the um, apartment complex, and every week, so he would have to say, "No, you have to pay your rent on time." And he would look at the camera and be like, "This is the real world." And then by two, and within like a year, though, the show embraced just camp absurdity, and Michael Mancini was one of the greatest comedic characters of all time. I, I I was such a huge fan. He, um, Marsha Cross, who later went on to Desperate Housewives, was also um, as Kimberly, just yes. so an angel. Oh my god, a, de a devil <laughs> angel. If you, I I love this woman. 
<laughs> it's just hard, like pre, pre, it's just, you know, again, pre, you know, it was just all you could do was go out in your dorm room and scream and you saw something was literally the, her removing the wig. And oh, like every, God. you know, everyone talking about, there was no real internet, you know, the, to live tweet the whole thing. You would just have to go on and on and just be excited about it. But it, yeah, can you tell me how, I mean, it's sort of the similar thing that you do with political commentary, but your, how do you, because essentially it's already absurd. So what do you, what do you do with the Melrose Place uh, videos? That's a great question. <laughs> um, <laughs> So my uh, fiance had never really watched Melrose Place like when it came out. He's two years younger than me, which would not make a big difference, except I was old enough to watch Melrose Place and he just it wasn't is into it. And and I, I was I loved it because I was like. Uh, Beverly Hills Letter 2 and I was so boring. And then Melrose Place, I was like, oh my gosh, the grown-ups are doing all the stuff my Barbies do. Like, this is great. <laughs> this place is exploding. <laughs> I was like having so much fun. And it it, it really, um, and so it was really just like, hey, you know what? There's so many episodes of this. And I, I, I've, I've watched it over the years multiple times. And it gets better and better because, uh, oh, do I have to allow storage? Yes, let's allow storage. Sorry, Ugh, technology. Um, but anyways, I was uh, re-watching it out of nostalgia. And I think, you know, especially like stressful times call for, you know, stuff where you know where, what's going to happen. And we, I, as someone now who's lived in Los Angeles for 20 years, I was like, this is so extra bananas <laughs> none of this makes sense the no. geography is wild it's so much fun um uh wilshire memorial i oh at one point i i was very tempted to put wilshire memorial as like hospital of choice you know on your like emergency <laughs> contact i was like i will die if i do that i can't that's not funny enough to have dr mancini treating me <laughs> the uh yeah, so the show, I mean, one of my favorites, something I often reference was there's um, the cliffhanger where we later learned it was Kimberly, but Kimberly runs over Michael. Oh my uh, God, in the and, wig, in the Jane wig. Yes, in the Jane wig, his ex-wife, like, framing his ex-wife. And so he wakes up, he's in the hospital, and he explains that, um, I remember everything about being a doctor, I just don't remember who I am. So it's a very so specific. situational, specific. And then they let him work as a doctor at that hospital. And it's just, I, if I were a patient, I would be like, well, okay, whatever this really convenient amnesia is, like, I'm glad he understands what a scalpel is, but he doesn't remember his 10th birthday. I'm going to pass. Like, I'm not like, sure. I know how to cut people open, but I don't know that woman. <laughs> I physically don't know. I don't, I don't remember. Like I remember all that I learned in college, but I don't remember going to college is just like, yeah. It's a blur. It's I a feel blur. Like, I feel like there's a great deal of um, liability there, but you know, I, it's interesting. Listen, um, everyone who was a chief of staff of that hospital got there through blackmail aside from the first. <laughs> So that's why you shouldn't put Wilshire Memorial as your emergency hospital. <laughs> it, well, and I I admit later, uh, because Grey's and I has been on for a thousand years, long enough that oh, predating yeah, yeah. my predating my uh, own marriage. And um <laughs> yeah, I, I should clarify once again that I am a straight man with a, who was watching uh, Miller's Place, usually probably in gay bars, because that's what they would play it. But like, oh, this was, a, for you. It, it was a wonder, it was just, I couldn't, it, I, I'm a, I have a love of camp that I just, I'm a theatrical person, I can't help it. But um, I was, I love Sandra Rhimes and I, uh, I res all respect to the sister for what she's done. But after a while I was like, oh, it's a little too, there's no, like, it should be camp. Why is this door, so grounded in the reality? The door is right there. Like, you had a, you know, there, you had Why a, is it your landlord also your boss and your boyfriend? <laughs> it's a lot of absurd stuff that would occur, like um, helicopters falling in and everything. And it would seem like, okay, well, this is just, just go full on camp. But it's, like, very, very, still very serious 
<laughs> I would think. So uh, I was always, after the first couple of seasons, I was so much, uh, uh, I stopped watching Grey's Anatomy. It did fine without me, but uh, that was always my challenge. It's like, I, you, it, you're right there. You're right there. Just be absurd. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> well, you know, I, I I should say now I'm remembering too. I started an Instagram. Well, I started posting Melrose clips, much like I'm doing the lip dubs. Just I was like like weird little moments that stuck out to me because also now I've worked in TV and now I know what goes on behind the scenes. And I was cracking up because I was like, I know what these knuckleheads are doing. This art department has given up. There are two egg beaters hanging in the window in the kitchen and i was like you guys were tired and so i just started posting little things and i think that's kind of and then i got some little followers and so i was like oh my gosh hey guys i started this instagram account called melrose madness and i was like all doing my melrose madness and i i i, I still am i actually have a podcast that i'm going to launch with my friend wayne lewis we are you know getting getting some podcasts and the episodes in the can and then the Gwyneth Paltrow thing happened and I, I got diverted and, and was like, oh my gosh, let me just, you know, pay attention to this. But I'm going back to Melrose Madness too, because listen, you and I, <laughs> the way we relaxed into that conversation, it was too easy. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, a maniac, you know, a Melrose maniac when you see one and it is... <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing. Like it, 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 it's so much fun to me because I, um, the characters are so, so I like predictable. And like one thing I did love about when the seasons were just kind of like hitting hard and those, like you said, cliffhanger. I mean, these guys were killing it with the cliffhangers. I remember one of the things I love about Melrose Place is a character right when they're starting to like get too big for their britches and they're like on top of the world with all their schemes, somebody comes and smacks them down. It's just like, you know, WWE, like as soon as somebody gets a little smack down and then there's so much joy in seeing people get their just desserts. And, um, oh, I just, no, no, no. Listen, I, yeah, I could go on we could for go forever. <laughs> I, I will wrap it up with just that. I think they let like every normal person on the show wound up going insane. And I lamp shaded it. <laughs> I think in the final episode, I think it was Michael who was saying like, like this must be the pool. It just makes someone crazy. Come to think of it. I was normal when I moved here. Like he was acknowledging. <laughs> His um, complete transformation. <laughs> yes, everyone completely became nuts, but it was it was a wonderful TV show. Uh, and I look forward to that podcast. Um, that was your one. Is it where else can um, people find you on YouTube, Twitter? You have your. I'm at Tim and Lisa everywhere. I okay. branded myself early, guys. And so <laughs> I'm, I, you know, it's funny. I haven't figured out TikTok. Uh, I'm on Twitter, but good Lord, it's terrifying and a lot to man maintain and YouTube. I want to do more on YouTube. I need to, okay. I, I have more long form stuff. I don't know if you've noticed, I started piecing together <laughs> trailers for fake television shows. <laughs> like, oh yeah, uh, that's it's funny. me, Drew, her hard hitting news story or Yo Soy Belinda. I'm going to make Yo Soy Belinda, by the way, the Belinda, <laughs> the housekeeper story, which is the docuseries <laughs> that Gwyneth Paltrow stars in. Uh, in which she uncovers the killer of her housekeeper, who she totally killed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I did, you know, I, I did not watch. I don't watch a Drew show, but I, you started doing it. Uh, like the, I've the, never the seen video. it before in my entire and, life. And <laughs> but later, I realized like she is doing Drew news. Like it wasn't. I first she thought you found. I think you happened to have found some where she's wearing like the important suit type thing and in the, the glasses. glasses and i thought that was maybe like a sketch that she had done or something you'd found but no let's see she's literally doing it. so that's that's fascinating um i cannot emphasize how little i change what they're doing or saying <laughs> like the when people go back so many people go back and they go i can't believe how like it's t it's a tiny bit different i mean they give me a lot of credit because but also I mean, come on, these guys, they're just serving it up. <laughs> oh, oh, indeed. Wonderful. So thank you so much for taking the time to uh, chat with me, Lisa, <laughs> and um, everyone, uh, Tim and Lisa, she's everywhere on the internet that you want to be. 
Um, once again, I am Steven Robinson. My I'm the play typer guy on YouTube. Like, share, subscribe, um, and uh, we'll uh, see you again soon. Thank you again, Lisa. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. This is so fun. <laughs>